but you can tell Flow has a philosophy, and that makes these games different. It makes them feel like they have a reason to exist besides just being fun. And that's why um, publishers are flocking to this category of game, right? So these guys started out with a Y, and they got the deal part basically handed to them. Um, so this talk is about making that kind of game, notable games that a lot of people are going to talk about as being you know, groundbreaking, not just about, hey, we finished a game and it's kind of fun. Right? So uh, we're striving here to make an excellent game coming from a place of deep motivation, um, which is not exactly an easy thing to do. Um, and to be totally honest, how, do we, how are we honest about evaluating these things? How do we really know that our game is excellent as opposed to just us fooling ourselves? Right? Because it's your baby. Uh, it's very easy to be convinced that your baby is beautiful. Uh, when in fact it's not, right? And how do you know that your motivation really is deep uh, instead of shallow? Um, so I'm gonna, I know that there's a spectrum of people in the room. Some people are new to independent games and some people have been here a while. So I'm gonna start uh, with a beginner part and then I'm gonna segue into a more advanced part. Um, so here are these how questions I was talking about that beginners like to ask, right? How do I start out? How do I get a deal? You know, how do I program it, maybe? And as I've said, I don't feel that these are very good questions. Um, the answers, you go to an hour talk that tries to give you answers to these, and the actual information that you get is not applicable to improve your situation. It just makes you feel like you heard a lot of talking. So I'm going to give everybody in the room uh, the actual secret to succeeding uh, as a new independent game developer. Okay. Here it goes. It's really, you know, it's, it's been kept through the ages, but here it is. Uh, the secret is that if you want to be, you already are an independent game developer, right? All you have to do is start making things, even the simplest, most basic things. Um, and a lot of people hold themselves back. They feel like, oh, I don't have the skills or I don't know enough people to make a team. You don't have to make a team, right? If you're an artist and you can't program, you can make something in Flash. There's lots of Flash games on the internet that have gotten a lot of attention, right? If you're a programmer with no art skills, make a cool game with just programmer art, right? Everyday shooter, that guy, you know, all the art in that game is algorithmically generated, right? If you're a designer and you don't know how to program, make a board game or a, you know, a paper gate based game, something even without a computer to hone your design skills, and then learn how to program, because all designers actually should know how to program, but that's a different topic. And uh, that's it for the beginner part of this lecture, but if you were a beginner, now that you know this, uh, you're now graduated to the advanced level, because that's all there is. Um, so now, uh, advanced level, how uh, do you go about being a game developer? Of course we want to avoid failure. The problem is that most independent developers fail uh, in two major ways. 95%, uh, and I'll say this 95 is a somewhat arbitrary number. I don't know what the actual number is, but it's certainly over 90. So we're going to say 95. 95% uh, of people who start out to develop an independent game project just never finish it. Um, so right there, 19 out of 20 games never come to fruition. Now, of that remaining 5%, 95% uh, of those get done, but they're just not very good, right? They don't, when, when a new person picks up this game and tries to play it, they don't see any reason why they would want to play this instead of Gears of War or even some other nondescript indie game, right? So how do we get around these problems? Um, uh, well, the reason that so many games don't get completed is that games are really big, right? They can take one year to three years maybe or more. Um, if you start out when you're planning your game and you think it's going to take one year to do, it actually is probably going to take three, right? And if you're starting out and you think it's going to take three, I don't know, that's just scary. Uh, you probably won't ever finish that one. Um, so uh, the, the key is, uh, as an advanced indie, to make sure that you've got the core game development skill nailed down, which is perseverance. Uh, don't ever quit at what you're doing, don't flake, and don't meander, because as long as you're making progress on your project, even if it's really slow, you will finish eventually, and that'll put you ahead of 19 out of 20 games, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, you don't even have to be super productive. All you have to do is be consistent. Um, so I'm sort of renaming these two things here. We have the completion goal, which is to get anything done at all, and the quality goal, which is to make it notable, to make it you know, a really strong entry in the pantheon of independent games. Um, I just talked about how hard it is to meet that completion goal, but the scary thing is that once we get past that, to get past the quality goal, we need to make the completion goal actually harder to attain, right? Because to get quality, you have to throw away some of the ideas you had because they weren't good enough. You have to throw out some of the programming you did because it's not quite the right thing, and some of the design ideas, and you have to throw away some of the art because it interferes with the gameplay. So 
you have to be twice as good as that completion goal, as I was just saying, in order to make quality. Because you end up redoing so many things over the course of development. Um, how do we know which of those things to throw out and redo? Um, that's sort of where the black art of uh, making a notable game comes in. And um, it's about, I think, approaching whatever your design vision is gradually instead of trying to jump right there. And as you implement the various things, honestly assess for yourself, did this work? Did this accomplish what I want? Or didn't it? Right? Um, and the way, uh, I call that the prototyping mindset, right? And what I would say about this is you want to always be prototyping. Right. Even if you think that you're in the production phase of your game and you're just cranking out the art in order to be finished, you should actually be prototyping and considering that stuff is temporary and be willing to replace it if it interferes with whatever you're doing. So what is this whole prototype thing? A lot of you probably know. Um, a prototype is about getting to the heart of your game and understanding it while doing as little work as possible. Because as we said, it can take many years to make a game. And you don't want to get two years into the development process of your game before you have it finally playable and you start playing it and then you realize, oh, this actually isn't really fun at all. And you just wasted two years, right? So you avoid that by prototyping. Um, you can find out by implementing the core gameplay in a little mini simplified version of your game, what's the player going to be doing? What are they going to be thinking and feeling like, right? And you don't focus on production values. You don't spend a lot of time on graphics and animations, except to the extent that they're necessary in order to feel the gameplay. And that's kind of a wishy-washy area that um, it's easy to fool yourself about, like, oh, we really do need this animation, but you know, you probably don't, or whatever. Right? So you're eliminating risk early uh, so that you know for sure whether you want to pursue this project for a couple of years or not. Um, so I could say a lot of general things about prototypes, but I like talking about specific examples instead, because then I know that what I'm talking about is real. So I'm going to talk about specific prototypes that I've done, and I'll focus in on various aspects of them to make points. Um, the first prototype um, I'm going to show is something I did probably in 2004. I don't know. Um, I was coming out of this phase in my life when I'd spent a lot of time on tech and doing 3D stuff. And it was all, it, you know, everyone in this room who's a high-end programmer probably knows how much incredible amount of time it takes to make game tech stuff work. And it doesn't give you that much time to think about or implement gameplay. So I wanted to go totally in the opposite direction. Do the simplest little dinkiest thing in terms of graphics and physics and whatever, and focus on uh, gameplay that, that was really different, that really gave me a, a different feeling. Um, and the origin of this game was, uh, I saw the Matrix uh, sequel movies, right? And there's a character in those called the Oracle who supposedly knows the future. And I thought those movies were really terribly written because this character like absolutely does not act anything at all like someone who can see the future. But that really got me thinking like, what what would it be like in reality? Um, can I make a game even in a very tiny uh, subdomain that gives you the feeling like you can see the future? And um, how well would that work? What would it be like? And so I came up with the idea of uh, um, this sort of. Uh, Billiards game or pool or I, I don't know what you guys call this in Australia, but um, you're just uh, knocking some balls around this sort of felt surface, and I didn't even make holes to knock them in because it turned out I didn't need them in order to understand uh, what I was going to come to understand from this. But basically, um, I'm controlling uh, the white ball at the bottom, and I can hit the space bar to knock it, and this meter over here controls how hard I'm going to hit it, uh, and I can rotate to aim. And you can see that there are these three balls in the middle that are solid, and then there are these sort of ghosted balls around the edge. And the ghosted balls are, if I take this shot right now, that is in the future where the balls will come to rest. So I can shoot the balls, and they'll sort of knock around, and they'll end up exactly where it said they would. Right? Because the game is running all those physics for that whole uh, table every frame. Right? I can sort of queue up a slightly more uh, complicated version here, and knock it, and... Uh, you see it happen again. And it's this very creepy feeling, I find, when I sort of get in the mode of playing with this. Yes, they always end up exactly where it says, right? And sometimes it's surprising. You're like, they're creeping slowly, and you're like, how would this ball actually get there? And then it barely touches another one, and it ricochets off and ends up. And you're like, oh, you know, that's, that's really interesting. So this game gave me what were actually kind of deep feelings that I'd never gotten from another game before. Um, you know, and it was just for this simple amount of programming effort. So from that standpoint, it was a very successful prototype. Um, 
Now, before I set out to do the programming, I had some ideas about what the actual game design 